Hello, and congratulations on becoming the proud owner of a Samsung Zoom Compact Camera. Now, whether you're a professional or a complete beginner in this wonderful world of photography, I'm sure that you'll be more than pleased with your new camera. In this video, I'm going to help you get the most from the camera you've just bought. I'll be looking at the various modes available and also talking about some of the more common mistakes that sometimes lead to your final photograph not turning out as you'd expect. If after watching this video, you'd like some more in-depth information, then I suggest you take a look at the comprehensive instruction manual that came with your camera. As you can see, all these cameras boast a high number of features, which include continuous shooting, macro and normal photography, landscape mode, backlight control, and even on some models, a remote control. All these innovative functions and modes are simple to use and easily identified on the LCD panel situated on top of the camera. I'll take a close look at all these modes a little later, but I'd like to start by looking at some of the more basic procedures that will ensure that you get the best from your camera. This range of cameras is powered by one or two lithium batteries. They come as standard, but like all batteries, they will eventually run down. On all these models, you have a battery condition indicator. If the battery is fully charged, the indicator will not show up in the LCD panel. If the indicator appears like this, then you still have enough power to shoot another one or possibly two rolls of film. But you will need new batteries beyond that. Should the symbol blink on and off, then you must replace the battery or battery straight away. Otherwise, your camera will not work. To replace the batteries is a quick and simple procedure. For example, on this camera, you open the battery chamber by inserting a pin into the hole. Take out the old batteries and insert your new batteries, making sure you place them in the correct position. Then close the battery chamber cover until you hear it click. To prolong the life of the batteries, these cameras have an automatic shutdown system that switches the camera off after three minutes of inactivity. Let's now move on to film loading. There are a number of film types available, and it's down to personal choice as to the one you use. Although we recommend a good quality 400 speed film like this in order to get the best from your camera. These cameras have Auto DX film setting, which automatically sets the correct film speed according to the particular film that you're using. To load the film, you, oh, just before we start, it's always advisable not to load the film in direct sunlight or in a brightly lit room. So if we take the lights down a bit, there, that's better. Right, to open the bag, use the release switch. Back open nicely. Take your film and gently lay it into the film chamber. There should be no need to force it. Then take the film end the mark that says film tip. Your film should lay flat across the back of the camera. You can now close the back of the camera until you hear it click. The film will automatically wind on. Should you see this symbol, a flashing E, then the film has been misloaded. Correct this by opening the camera and repeating the loading procedure. Okay, let's have the lights back up. Film rewind is fully automatic. Watch. This camera has one last shot to take, so I'll just take a picture, well, you for example. Now, hear that? The film is automatically rewinding. This will take a couple of seconds, and when complete, the film indicator on the LCD panel will blink. There is also the facility, should you need it, to rewind the film in the middle of the roll. Once again, instructions on how to do this, and more in-depth information on all the modes are available in the instruction manual. There we go, the film has fully rewound and you can now open the back cover, remove and replace the film and off you go. Let's return to our newly loaded camera. We're almost ready to take our first picture. So let's turn the camera on by using the on and off button. As you can see, the camera springs into action immediately. The lens opens and more information appears on the LCD panel. The cameras are preset with both auto flash and auto focus. 
so you could in fact start taking pictures straight away. On this and some of the models you have a diopter adjuster on the viewfinder, which adjusts for individual eyesight requirements. Simply select the setting that's most suitable for your eyesight. Now let's take a closer look at the modes available, starting with the focus mode. Like most of the modes available, you select them by pressing the appropriate mode buttons. A key to these is in your manual. The cameras in this range have a number of focus modes, and when you initially turn the camera on, it's always in the autofocus mode. This part of the camera is where the information is relayed back to the microcomputer, and in turn works out the correct focus. So make sure you don't have your finger over it, otherwise you won't allow for a true reading, and the autofocus will not work. Now, if you want to compose a photo where your subject is on the edge of frame, then use the autofocus in conjunction with the focus lock mode. To do this, you aim the camera with the autofocus frame superimposed over your subject. Press the shutter button halfway down and you'll see a green light in the viewfinder. Be careful not to press the button all the way down, otherwise you'll end up with an unwanted photograph. Keeping your finger on the button, you can then recompose your picture. Hold the camera steady, gently press the button all the way down, and your subject will be in focus. Some models have a snap mode, which overrides the autofocus system and is particularly useful when photographing difficult subjects such as active children or pets, who tend not to stay in the same position for long. This means that as long as your subject is between 1.3 and 5 metres away from the camera, they'll be in sharp focus. But what about shooting through windows? When your camera is in its standard autofocus mode, it'll quite naturally focus on the glass and not the subject. But if you keep your finger on the landscape or infinity button, then the camera will focus on the subject and not the glass. Now we move on to the zoom modes. This allows you to get even closer to your subject without physically moving. The range of Samsung Zoom Compact cameras has a variety of choices of focal length, which determines the angle of view the camera sees, from 28mm for those wide-angle shots, right up to 115mm for those more intimate close-ups. Zooming between the different focal lengths, and therefore changing the view you see through the viewfinder and the picture you take, is done using the W and T zoom buttons. W stands for wide angle and will retract the zoom, whilst T stands for telephoto and will extend the zoom to make your subject appear nearer. The self timer, or on some models the double self timer, allows you the photographer to get in on the picture. With your camera mounted on a tripod or a steady surface and the mode chosen, you simply press the shutter button and you then have 10 seconds to get into position before the camera takes the picture. One photo in self-timer mode and if you have it, two photos in double self-timer mode. And don't forget to smile. Another mode is the two second delay shutter release. This eliminates the slight camera shake which you may encounter when you actually press the shutter button. In this mode, the picture is taken two seconds after you press the button. Other features on some of these cameras include a built-in microcomputer, which works out the focal length, flash and shutter speed, and eliminates camera shake when it's in fuzzy mode, giving you the perfectly exposed photo every time. Where featured, portrait mode will maintain a constant size within the frame, even though the distance to the subject may change. To activate this, select the portrait mode and gently touch the shutter button and the camera zooms into the ideal setting and composition for your portrait. This is particularly useful if you want to take head and shoulder shots. Just press the shutter button halfway down and the camera composes the shot for you. If your camera has the step zoom mode, then this is useful if you want to take a number of pictures of the same subject using different focal lengths, giving you a wide variety of pictures. Just zoom out, select step, and press the shutter button. If your camera has a set button, you can manually adjust the number of photos to be taken in step mode. For further details, please refer to your instruction booklet. The range of special effects modes on these cameras 
allow you to have fun and be more adventurous with your photography. In continuous shooting mode, as long as you keep your finger pressed down on the shutter button, then the camera will continue to take pictures with the autofocus automatically adjusting for every picture. Great for those action shots. If your camera has multi-exposure shooting mode, it can cause a few surprise reactions when your photos are developed and you have a picture of yourself standing next to yourself. This is achieved when you press the shutter button. It will take the initial shot, but will not advance the film until the next shot has been taken. Subsequently, if you're standing here on your first exposure, and here for the next exposure, the resulting image will look something like this. Who, Who said, said the, the camera, camera never lies? lies? A number of cameras feature interval shooting. When using this mode, the camera is set up on something like a tripod or a wall to take a sequence of pictures automatically. For example, taking pictures of a sunset or a sunrise or flowers opening. The desired interval can be selected using the T and W buttons while holding down the flash, or in some cameras, the set button. Bulb shooting is the mode to use if you want to choose how long the shutter will stay open when the shutter button is pressed. The longer the shutter is open, or technically the length of the exposure, the more light you let in through the lens. This mode is very useful when shooting night scenes, for example a fireworks display. You can choose a shutter speed between one second up to one minute by keeping your finger depressed on the shutter button. When using bulb shooting, it's always advisable to have your camera mounted on a tripod or a steady surface to avoid camera shake. Next, we have the flash mode. The flash is primarily used to give more light on the subject when existing light levels are too low, for example at night or in a dark or dim room. When you switch on your camera, it automatically presets to auto flash mode, which, as it suggests, operates the flash automatically when it's needed. There are a number of other flash modes available, and each one is depicted by a small symbol in the LCD panel on the top of the camera. These modes are accessed using the flash button, and on some models, an additional button on the back of the camera. In red-eye reduction mode, the camera fires a pre-flash just before the main flash, reducing that disturbing red-eye effect. Backlight control is used when the subject is not as brightly lit as the background. With the backlight control, the camera will balance your subject with a strong background light. Some cameras feature exposure compensation. In this mode, you can manually alter the camera's exposure level. Alter the setting by pressing the zoom buttons, T and W, while keeping the flash button, or on some cameras the set button, pressed down. If you see either of these symbols, then it's a warning that your camera should be placed on a tripod or a steady surface. Still in flash is helpful if your subject is in shadow, but the lighting conditions around them are too strong for the auto flash to operate. The still in flash will lighten the dark areas of your subject. A very similar mode to this is the still in pre flash. This is still in flash with the added advantage of red eye reduction. And the final mode is flash off. One thing to bear in mind, and it is a common fault when using flash photography, is to make sure that you don't cover the flash with your fingers. As with the autofocus window, the flash needs to be clear of any obstructions for it to work efficiently. Also, the flash does need time to recharge after use, so be patient. Just because you can't take flash photograph after flash photograph doesn't mean your camera is broken. It only takes a few seconds to recharge. So, with your finger depressed on the shutter button, look out for the flash ready indicator in the viewfinder. When the red light stops flashing, your flash is fully charged and you can safely take your picture. This is a battery powered remote control unit, which comes as an optional extra on some cameras. With this and the camera in remote control mode, you can operate the camera from a distance of five meters away. You can activate the zoom and of course actually take a picture. This is useful if you want, for example, to take pictures of wild animals or birds without creating a disturbance. Should on the other hand you want to take really close-up pictures, 
you can use the mode known as macro photography. This allows you to take pictures of subjects that are as close as 60 centimeters to the camera. When using this mode to take close-up pictures, remember that what you see through the viewfinder is slightly different to the area covered by the camera lens. To compensate for this, recompose your picture using the macro frame marking, which, depending on your camera, will either look like this, or like this. But your finished picture will look like this. Also, when using macro, the green light in the viewfinder will blink slowly, indicating that your subject is within the correct macro range. If, however, you get a little too close, the green light blinks rapidly and the shutter automatically locks. Don't override the system by getting any closer. Some cameras feature super macro and automatic macro. For more details, refer to your instruction manual. If your camera has panorama photography mode, at the flick of a switch, you can change this picture to this. If you do decide to use a panorama mode, don't forget to notify the film processing company. Otherwise, the film may not be developed in its correct form. Finally, if you have date in printing, which rather speaks for itself, you can, by setting these buttons, print the date the photo is actually taken on the photograph. Once again, more details are available in the instruction manual. Well, there you have it. The highly versatile range of zoom compact cameras from Samsung. I hope you enjoy both using and the results you get from any of these compact cameras. Now, before I go, I'd just like to talk about care and storage. The more attention you pay to your camera, the better the results and the longer your camera will last. So, never take your camera onto the beach, as sand and water can cause irreversible damage. Likewise, never leave your camera in direct sunlight or in hot places, such as in a parked car. It's always best to keep your camera in a cool, dry place that's free from humidity and dust. Avoid using alcohol or any other chemical solvents when cleaning the camera. It's best just to wipe it gently with a soft cloth. And finally, in the unlikely event of your camera not functioning correctly, please return it to the shop you bought it from or call the Samsung customer helpline on 0645 223232. This call will be charged at local call rate. Well, that's about it. It's all up to you now. As I said at the beginning, it doesn't matter if you're a professional or a complete beginner. With your new Samsung Compact Camera, I guarantee that you'll be more than happy with what develops. Thank you and happy shooting. And don't forget, coming up next, taking better pictures with your Compact Camera. Ensure that you receive the best possible after sale service from Samsung cameras, please fill in the simple warranty registration card and questionnaire, which was packed in the box of your camera, and return it to the address shown on the card. Thank you. Every day, millions of people all over the world take photographs. The estimated total of photographs taken in one year is over 40 billion. Most of this incredible total is made up by photographs taken by people just like you, for your own fun and pleasure. And it's for you that Samsung are happy to present this video that sets out to show how to go about taking better pictures with your compact camera. Taking a photograph, once you understand the basic principles, is as simple as pushing a button. That's where we're going to start. Later on, we'll be looking at how to handle your camera, how to take that perfect picture, and finally a look at special subjects such as pets, children, weddings, and holidays. A camera really is nothing more than a light, tight box that allows an image to be focused onto a strip of light-sensitive material, or film, which is placed inside it. Photography needs several important component parts to make it work. These are a camera, some film, and a subject. Well, perhaps we don't need the subject just yet. Right then, you've got your new compact camera. Good. Then let's have a look at it. Do you know much about photography? 
Okay, then let me show you some of the features. The lens is important, since this is what focuses the image onto the film. Modern day lenses are designed to give the best possible results over a wide range of conditions. Different types of cameras come with various lenses of varying focal lengths. The focal length of the lens determines what angle of view the camera sees. The focal length on compact cameras can vary from around 28 millimeters to 140 millimeters. The compact camera you have has a zoom lens that can give you a view of a subject anywhere between 35 millimeters to 70 millimeters. Let me give you a demonstration. I think it'll be better if we went outside. Okay, that's better. Now, if we're looking at you through a lens with a focal length of 35 millimeters, you'd look like this. But through a 70 millimeter lens, you'd look like this. See the difference? Through the 70mm lens, everything appears in the picture bigger or closer. Through a 35mm lens, we can get a lot more into the picture, but everything is smaller. Consequently, if we had a 28mm lens, we could get even more in. And with a 140mm lens, as fitted on some cameras, we can get really close up. So as you can see, the higher the lens number, the closer you can get to the subject. The smaller the number, the more you can get into your picture. What you've just seen is a zoom lens in action. I wouldn't worry if you haven't got quite to grips with focal lengths. You don't need to know that much about these, but a little understanding will help in getting that perfect picture. Now, how many times has this happened to you? Not many, I should imagine. At the moment, you're out of focus. Some would say it's an improvement, but when taking a picture, it's not very satisfactory. So we need a way to get the photograph we take into sharp focus. Even on the simplest of compact cameras, we don't have to worry too much, as many of them use what is known as a fixed focus lens. This is a lens that has been set by the manufacturers in such a way that everything from about one and a half meters onwards will be more or less in focus. Many compact cameras have an autofocus system which works by emitting an infrared beam from the camera when the shutter button is pressed. The beam bounces back from the subject to the camera, which in turn adjusts the lens accordingly. This system works well in most conditions, but you must take care when using it to photograph through a window. This is because the beam from the camera will bounce back from the window and not your subject, giving the camera false information. On many cameras, this can be solved by using the infinity or landscape button. Right, I think that's covered most of the basics. OK, ready to take a picture? Got the subject? Oh. Ah, good. Use the zoom lens to frame your subject. Is she in focus? Good. Loaded the film correctly? Ah. Then let's load the film into the camera. As it's always advisable to load and unload your film in subdued light, it might be a good idea to do this back inside. OK, now when choosing a film, you need to be sure that it'll give you good colour and sharpness. Most of today's films meet these requirements quite adequately, but it's always worth trying out different ones to find your own preference. On this occasion, I'd recommend this film. It has a speed of 400. It's all right, don't panic, I'll explain. When the film is manufactured, the makers can alter the sensitivity or speed of different films. The speed of the film is an indication of how it will react to light. A fast film reacts quickly, whilst a slower film is not so sensitive. To give you an example, if we were taking a picture of you and there wasn't much light available, you'd need a film that would make as much use of the available light when the shutters open. 400 speed film handles these types of situations quite easily. You can recognize the speed of the film by looking at the ISO number. This is printed on both the film and the side of the box it came in. Also, while you're looking here, always check the expiry date of the film. Don't run the risk of using out of date film. OK, back to the ISO number. Can you see now the film's ISO number is 400? This is classed as a medium to fast speed film and is ideal for normal everyday photography. 
100 speed film, for example, which is slower, would be ideal if you were thinking of taking photographs with the intention of making them into enlargements. There are some specialist films with a speed of a thousand or more, but most situations can be handled by the ones we've mentioned. Before we move on, just a couple of tips on film. Always try to keep the film cool. Don't leave film or cameras in direct sunlight or in hot cars. It will not do either any good. If you do have to leave your camera in a car, lock it in the boot, which is cooler and out of sight of any would-be thief. Always keep a spare film with you, or better still, buy a twin pack. It's normally cheaper, and that way you'll never have to worry about missing a picture opportunity because you've run out of film. Try to have your film processed promptly, ideally as soon as it comes out of the camera. Nearly every town in the country has a good quality processor, like this one, for example. They can offer many services from one hour developing to enlargements and reprints, from photo albums and frames to your favorite photograph transformed into an intriguing jigsaw puzzle. Don't be afraid to ask what's on offer. I can guarantee you'll be pleasantly surprised. Loading the film into the camera doesn't really present too many problems these days. Most of the cameras have what is called the easy loading system, just like the camera you have, in fact. First, you open the camera. Lay the film across the back. Never force the cassette. It should fit in gently and snugly. Always be generous with your film. Pull out enough film to reach the take-up spool. Some cameras have this mark to help you. Alternatively, check that the film perforations are interlocking with the gear wheels. Now close the back and the film is fed onto the take-up spool. On this model, the film is automatically wound onto the first frame. But with some compacts, you may need to press the shutter button a couple of times. Most cameras these days even give a warning if the film has been misloaded. Remember we spoke about film speed a while ago? Well, now it's time to tell the camera what speed or ISO setting we're using. We can do this in two ways. One is by setting a switch, or more commonly nowadays, cameras have the DX system, which is fitted to most compacts. The DX system works by recognizing the pattern on the side of the film cassette. This is the DX pattern and will differ in appearance depending on the speed of the film. It's always best to check in the instruction booklet to make sure that the film you have chosen is suitable. These sensors read the pattern and recognize the film and set the speed accordingly. OK, so we've talked about the basics of the camera. Focal length, focusing, film speeds and the DX facility. It's now time to take our first photo. And... Ah! Now this is Tony. Unlike his father, Tony is quite experienced at taking photographs, so we're in good hands here. Oh, and we also have Jack, Tony's younger brother and budding photographer. Jack's compact hasn't as many features as his brother's camera, but the results can be equally as impressive. OK, boys, have we got a subject? Ah. Ah, I see. Very nice. Let's have a look at this through the viewfinder. Looking through it will give you some idea as to how your picture will appear. If you wear spectacles or sunglasses, like the boys are, make sure to press the viewfinder right up close. Let's have a look. Make sure that you can see all four corners inside the viewfinder when you look through. This way you'll be sure to get everything in the picture. There's nothing more annoying than missing some important part of the picture. The camera Tony's using has a zoom lens, so he can adjust the view to suit the subject. Jack's camera doesn't have a zoom lens, so he has to frame the shot by physically moving back and forth. This is a good time to point out that when your final photograph is developed and printed, you do lose a slight amount of the picture around the edge, so it's always best to allow for this when looking through the viewfinder. Once we've got all we want in the picture, we need to make sure that it's in focus. As I said earlier, most compact cameras can hold focus from about a metre and a half. 
If you're going to take a close-up like this, allow a bit more space around your subject to avoid cutting off heads. On an autofocus camera, simply center the main subject in the focus spot. As long as your subject is in the spot, your final picture will be nice and clear. The autofocus distance can range from half a meter to infinity. But what if your subject, like Mina here, is not in the center of frame? This can be rectified by pointing the camera directly at the subject and then setting the focus lock. You do this by pressing the shutter button down halfway. Recompose the picture, keeping the button lightly pressed and then press down fully to release the shutter. Composition is quite an art form in itself, but you really don't have to be that artistic to apply the simple rules. At first glance, this shot looks to be OK. So let's take it. OK, now let's take another one, and we'll let Tony play with the composition. He'll be looking for ways to compose the picture so that it'll be more interesting. While he's doing that, let's just talk a bit about holding the camera. When taking any photographs, it's always essential to make sure that the camera doesn't move. Otherwise, you could end up with camera shake, resulting in a blurred photo. But saying this, some compact cameras have a fuzzy mode. This is a built-in microcomputer that adjusts the shutter speed, flash, and even the zoom to produce the ideal shot. If your camera doesn't have this mode, like Jack's, then you can hold the camera steadier by tucking your elbows into your side. Make sure your feet are slightly apart and that you feel comfortable. Don't take too long taking the picture as the normal tendency is to start swaying. And finally, gently squeeze the shutter button. Now, did you notice that Tony used the flash this time? Many people think that the flash is only required when taking pictures in the dark. In fact, the use of flash, even on a bright day like today, can often improve your photograph. This mode on the camera is called fill-in flash. This will help rid the subject of any dark shadows and will create a balanced shot. Some compact cameras have an automatic flash. This is where the camera has a built-in computer that works automatically when light conditions are poor. In this mode, the flash works only when necessary. When taking your photo, make sure that your fingers don't obscure the flash, or even worse, the lens. Many a picture has been ruined by not observing this simple rule. Don't forget that the autofocus won't work if it's covered up, so watch out for stray camera straps or even long hair getting in the way. You can also override the flash if you don't want it to go off at all by using the flash off or flash defeat button. Under these conditions, you'll have to keep the camera very steady, like on a wall or even a tripod. While we're talking about the flash, let's talk about red eye. We've all seen it. You take a picture of someone using the flash, and when the photos come back from the processors, your subject has developed the look of a vampire. This disturbing effect is known as red eye. It's caused when the flash is triggered and the light is reflected from the back of the eye, through the enlarged pupil. Fair-skinned people, especially those with blue eyes, are very susceptible. Children also seem to suffer more. This is an annoying problem, but it can be improved. One way is to turn all the lights on in the room. Even better, try a position of bright light behind the photographer. If you're using a zoom camera, you could also use a wider setting. With some compact cameras, you have a facility known as red eye reduction. This is achieved by a flash which causes the subject's pupils to contract before the main flash goes off, reducing the red eye effect. Used in conjunction with appropriate lighting, it can be very effective. Also, watch out for reflective surfaces in the background, such as mirrors or windows. Remember, if you can see the flash, so can the camera. Don't forget that flash is only effective over a certain distance. With an average camera, your subject can be around three and a half meters away, around four paces. Any further, and the picture will be dull and disappointing. You can increase this distance by using a faster film, like 400 speed. 
Check your instruction manual to find out what's needed to suit your requirements. OK, back to Tony's photos now and see how he's treated the same subject. This picture, Tony's worked more on the composition. Here, the picture looks a bit flat. This was taken without the fill-in flash. See the dark shadows. These have been eliminated in this shot. In the first photo, the horizon line more or less splits the photo in two. In the second picture, Tony's moved the horizon into the upper part of the photo, making it much more interesting. He's also moved in closer for more impact. The first shot had too much background, which distracts from the main subject. Talking about the subject in this photograph, Mina isn't even looking at the camera or into the photo. And what's that growing out of her head? When you take a picture, allow a second or two to get the most out of your shot. Look through the viewfinder and remember that what you see is what you get. So if your subject is far away in the viewfinder, it'll look far away in the final shot. Also, make sure that people are looking into the photo rather than out of it. Make sure that trees, lampposts or any other prominent structures are not growing out of your subject's head. Try to keep the background simple. Don't let it distract from the subject. Tony's used an overhanging branch in the foreground of the picture to give it a feeling of depth. Once you've started to think a bit more about how the finished picture will look, you'll soon start looking for ways to improve the composition, and that's guaranteed to improve your photographs. Let's just hold it there. In this photo, Tony and Jack are in the shot. So who took the picture? Well, it was Tony, actually. Tony set the camera on a solid surface, composed his shot, then selected the self-timer mode. This sets the camera on a 10-second delay, giving Tony enough time to run back and sit with Mina and Jack, check the hair, and smile. Most compact cameras come with their own carrying case, and it's always advisable to keep the camera in it when you're not using it. This will stop any scratches to the bodywork and cushion any knocks. The lens on the camera has been manufactured to the highest possible standard and will give a first-class service provided that you give it just a little attention from time to time. For instance, make sure that you don't get fingerprints or dust on the lens. Also be aware of moisture on the lens, which is caused by a change in the humidity. You can clean the lens by polishing it very gently with a lens cleaning tissue, or, if in an emergency, a clean handkerchief. Be extra careful when you take your camera on holiday, especially when going onto the beach. Even a small amount of sand or water inside a camera will certainly spell disaster. It's probably a good idea to use a disposable camera on the beach. In fact, some are even designed to go underwater. When you finish taking pictures, turn the camera off to save the battery. Some automatically close themselves down after a few minutes of inactivity. It doesn't take much to look after a camera but just a little bit of attention will go a long way. A wedding invitation. An ideal opportunity for a day out with the camera. But before we don our glad rags and wish the happy couple well, let's have a look at one or two special subjects that put the fun into photography. And let's start with pets. Pets can be wonderful subjects, regardless of whether it's something really exotic or just the family dog like Molly here. To get the best results, you need to make a few special considerations. One thing you'll need is patience if you're to take successful animal shots. Believe me, the rewards will be worth waiting for. It's often a good idea, if not a comfortable one, to get down to the same level as the subject. This will give you a different viewpoint and also have the advantage that it may catch the animal's attention, giving her a better expression. Try to use a lens with a longer focal length for this type of shot. A zoom lens camera would be ideal. But as Jack will agree, not absolutely necessary. If you're taking some semi-formal shots, then always take into consideration the pose that your subject is in. Look at these two pictures and see how the positioning of Molly makes all the difference. Once again, when Tony was taking his pictures, remember composition. 
make sure the background isn't too distracting and enjoy yourself. This photo neatly leads us on to the next special subject, photographing children. Many of the points we raised when we spoke about taking photos of animals can be applied when photographing children. Get close, keep backgrounds clear, and so on. Posing children can sometimes lead to a stiff, embarrassed look, or sometimes a very silly face. Thank you, Jack. So, invariably, children photograph best when you catch them unaware. You could also give your subject a prop, such as a toy or a pair of sunglasses. It'll help to make the pose more interesting and natural. This doesn't mean that a less candid shot of a child will not work. Look at this selection of our Jack. Here's a good shot. What Mum did was to have the light coming from behind Jack rather than behind the camera. Backlighting brings out the natural effect of hair and makes the subject stand out against the background. A fill-in flash helps balance the shot. This is so easy to achieve, and the only precaution you need to take is to ensure that the sun is not shining directly into the camera lens. You can avoid this by shielding the lens with your hand or a book. Some cameras can create some interesting special effects, like multi-exposure. You can combine a number of images on a single frame. Interval shooting allows you to take shots of a subject that changes at regular intervals, like, for example, a flower opening or a sunset. Just set the camera to the desired interval between shots, which can be anything between 10 seconds and an hour. The camera will do the rest. Macro photography is basically taking pictures of things very close up. How close? Down to 40 centimetres on some cameras. Experiment and enjoy. Talking about enjoyment, let's go off to that wedding. Everybody these days comes to a wedding armed with a camera. They all want to get a shot of the happy couple, and quite right too. But how can you make your pictures a little bit special from the rest? Most of the points we've already spoken about will help. One of the most important is composition. Watch out for distracting backgrounds. And if it's a church wedding, watch out for untidy corners of the grounds, for example. At most weddings, there'll be the official photographer. Watching how a professional works can be fascinating and beneficial to you. See how he organises shots, especially the formal family groups. You could also move nearer and take a similar shot without the headache of setting it up. Try to get some really close-up shots of the bride and groom. As we already know, with most modern cameras, you can get really close. Shots like this are full of impact and always make good photographs. Obviously, it's the couple's big day, and most, including the official photographer, will be clicking away at them. What they'll not be concerned with is the informal, candid-type photos. Other guests, and especially children caught in natural poses and some humorous situations, can really capture the atmosphere of the whole day. Even some off-guarded moments between the bride and groom can be fun when captured on film. In amongst all the excitement, getting that perfectly composed picture could be a problem, but some cameras have a portrait mode. This mode automatically frames the picture for a head and shoulder shot, an ideal feature under these circumstances. Just before we leave, there's just one more thing to take place, the throwing of the confetti. This will also allow Mum to show off another feature on her camera, the continuous shooting mode. In this mode, you just keep your finger on the shutter and the camera just keeps on firing. The autofocus automatically adjusts for each shot. It's always best to keep your photos in an album for two reasons, really. One is that this will protect the photographs from getting marked by constant handling. And secondly, it's much easier and convenient to flick through an album than sorting through the sideboard drawer where most people keep their photos and nine times out of 10, forget about them. Oh, and don't forget to keep your negatives safe in the wallet. These are vital when it comes to getting reprints and enlargements. If you want to display your photos in even more creative ways, you can also have them transferred to plates, cups, jigsaws, calendars, and all manner of things. As I said earlier, all these ideas and more can be offered by your local processor.
Another creative way to display your photos is as a framed montage, like this one. Never be afraid to cut up your pictures. Just a small bit can be just as interesting. Remember, holidays are a great time to get some wonderful pictures. Apart from the this is me outside the hotel on the beach in the bar type shots, look around at the landscapes. Shots of beautiful beaches or majestic mountains can be just as memorable of your days away. On some cameras, you have a panoramic mode that gives you a unique image expanse. If your camera doesn't have this feature, then take a couple of shots. Then, when you get the photos back, join them together for some spectacular results. If you're taking photos in panoramic mode, don't forget to mention it to the processor when you hand the film in. A couple of tips when taking photos on holiday. Remember, if you're taking a picture through a coach or train window using autofocus, use the infinity button. Otherwise, the camera will focus on the window and not the view. Look after your camera when you're on holiday. Keep it with you all the time, preferably attached to your body by the neck or wrist strap. Another thing worth mentioning is politeness when taking pictures of the locals. Don't just snap away at old fishermen on the quay or shove the camera into the face of the old lady toiling in the field. Ask first. Above all, photography, like your holiday, should be fun. Once again, when you come to putting the photos in an album, be creative. Make a story of your holiday. For example, have a shot of mum trying to pack the suitcase. Save used tickets from places you've visited or drip mats from bars you've frequented. It all adds to the overall presentation. As camera technology grows, so more and more modes become available. But it'll be a long time before there'll be a camera that doesn't need a photographer. This video has helped with the basics of photography. You are the most important part of a camera. Your creativity, your imagination, and most of all your enthusiasm to take good photographs all go to getting the best from your compact camera. And remember, have fun. Thank <laughs> you.